Welcome to Behind the Tools. Here's Tradeify CEO and your host, Michael Steckler. Hi, everyone. Just before we get into this week's episode, I'd like to quickly let you know about a fun competition we're running over on Instagram, the Tradeify Van Games. We want you to show us what makes your van, truck, or work vehicle special. Whether your wheels are worth showing off or ready to be replaced, share a picture with us on Instagram and be in it to win cash prizes and tool bundles. Now, there are prizes for the best overall setup, the most unique, and the rig that is in need of the most TLC. To find out more about the prizes and how to enter, please do head over to our Instagram page at Tradeify HQ. That's our Instagram page at Tradeify HQ. Entries close on the 14th of November and best of luck. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Behind the Tools. Um, got a great guest this week. Uh, and in full disclosure, actually one of our board members, uh, so a board director at Tradeify, Anne Timpany. Um, Anne is originally from New Zealand, uh, but actually moved to the UK in 2003. Uh, is an award-winning entrepreneur, built a very successful plumbing business in the UK. Um, was a woman in construction ambassador, freeman of the City of London, and a liveryman in the Worshipful Company of Plumbers, which is one of the oldest uh, liveries uh, in the UK. So it's a very distinguished career uh, working in the trades. Has recently, I say recently, um, probably a year or so, been back in back in New Zealand and moved back to New Zealand. Is based in Wanaka. And Wanaka, for those that don't know, is a very scenic, lovely part of the world on the South Island. Very, I say very close, not as close as you would think, but closest to Queenstown, um, probably the more well-known uh, tourist destination. So Anne, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, it's great to, great to have you on board. So Anne joined the, the Board of Tradeify, I want to say probably six months ago, it might even have been longer, um, to help us think through kind of how we approach trades and how we can help trade businesses uh, globally. Uh, and Anne's obviously experience in both New Zealand and, and the UK um, has, been, has been really useful. Maybe to start, Anne, do you want to give us a bit of background about the business that you ran in the UK and how you got into, how you got into the trades? Yes, yes, absolutely. So um, my husband and I started a plumbing company in London, in North London, actually, in uh, 2009. So I had been working in hospitality and events and management in London, and it was the GFC, and I was made redundant. So I had I was a bit at a bit of a loose end. Um, my career prior to that was always marketing and sales. That was my um, strengths and what I had my qualifications in. And my husband reached a ceiling with the plumber he was working for in North London, uh, the kind of salary ceiling. He's always been a very ambitious individual and he wanted to go out on his own. So he said to me, well, I want to start my own plumbing company. And I said, well, you don't know much about sales and marketing. You know, he had a plum though said I could help you on the sales and marketing side. And so on tap plumbers was born. So we ran our company oh. for 10 years in London and um, we went through some um, really interesting growth periods and we were lucky enough to be riding on the wave of a very um, long, amazing construction period in London's landscape history. Yeah, it was interesting you did it just after the and the, the GFC, the global financial crisis. Um, and did you have a, a view, you know, about the sort of customer you would go after? Did you already have, did your husband already have customers that he'd worked with that he wanted to sort of kick the business off with? How did you approach that? So my husband was always very loyal to his old boss and he was, he did not feel comfortable about poaching any of his customers. If they approached us, that was a different story. But um, so we never poached customers. We really started from scratch and both of us were immigrants. Yep. So my husband's originally from Albania and me being from New Zealand, we're obviously not locals in, in, in the UK. So we didn't have family or friends to fall back on to ring us up to do a boiler change or renovate their bathroom. So we literally started from scratch. Um, with my background being in marketing and sales, I didn't. I wanted us to be quite unique in the trades landscape, and I didn't want us to be. You know, we wanted to be a bit more creative with our marketing and our branding. Right. Our name, for example, being on tap plumbers as opposed to our names, um, and we wanted to be big, look bigger than we actually were from day dot, um, because we had big, big vision for the company. Um, so I, we created a logo that um, was really clever and um, not like any other logo in trades businesses. We created a website straight away. We got straight onto social media. 
And we went out there with a mission. And our mission was to dispel the myth of cowboy trades because uh, in the UK, as all the tradies listening from over there will know, there is, you know, there's a real stigma around trades people in the UK being rogue traders and cowboys. So we really wanted to create a business that dispelled that myth. And it worked. It worked really well. So me being the kind of face of the business from the sales and marketing perspective and uh, me going out there and, and really being, you know, getting all the business in as a woman um, helped our business considerably and appealed, obviously, to other women. And it, funnily yeah. enough, came around to evolved around to us realizing that our probably our biggest target market was women. They were the ones at home. They were the ones making the decisions about what kind of bath they wanted or what kind of tiles they wanted. Um, they were the people that were at home when my husband came to visit to do carry out any plumbing work or do any quotes or estimates. So that really evolved into that um, us being a very female focused uh, trades business. Yeah, and were you? I guess at that time, back then, even still even today, that was probably quite unusual. I would imagine to have it was still predominantly being a male-dominated industry. Um, and do you think that that helped sort of attract those types of customers, or were you very intentional about how you messaged or approached those customers? Uh, it definitely helped. Um, I think that women, you know, with with that whole reputation around rogue traders i think that uh, women and customers in general tend to trust females a little bit more it's unusual in the fact that most of the time when a woman and husband work together in a trades business the woman's usually in the background she's very rarely at the forefront of the business she's usually just doing a bit of bookkeeping and you know sending out some invoices and things like that usually the um, husband is carrying out all the other kind of front facing of the business so it is a very unusual approach um, and also being from New Zealand as well I think may have helped being a little bit different but still speaking English and um, having a very kind of relaxed can-do attitude I think helped as well. And how did you win those first customers what was the the thing that sort of got people calling you or getting in touch? I would say it was a lot to do with the relationship building. So in our first year, 90% of our work came from the networking that I did throughout North London. So I visited a lot of networking groups. <laughs> I went to BNI, I went to Women in Business, I went to Athena, all these female-focused networking groups. Um, and I really started to develop a lot of relationships with other small business owners that were, you know, also in the same position with me. And it was really those kind of referrals back and forth, being very active, yeah. being very proactive and helping not only uh, myself get some business, but also helping those other people get business and being very genuine and authentic about that. Um, I think that's what really helped get us going. Um, and then that have, we continued that growth over the next couple of years as we were doing domestic plumbing. It's a, it's a really interesting, um, the BNI thing I've heard a lot from tradespeople that are either looking to get help with something, but actually it's a really powerful network. There was one where actually a trade company met the local Toyota car dealer, I think it was, and then bought his vans. So that, you know, so there is a real kind of um, shared thing that can happen there. It's kind of reciprocal, right, in terms of business generation. Mm. So that's a really good way of doing it. So there was an element, I guess, of pounding the pavements and just meeting lots of people and doing the canapes and the yeah. events, all the things that go with it, right? And just and that and it came from that. That's Absolutely. a really it's an interesting approach. I think it's good for it's good advice for trades business in general, right? Because once you get that trust and it's very regional, it tends to be a very locally focused thing. Yes. So um it's better for yeah, a trader to stay quite local as well yes. because if they have to travel especially in London if you have to, tra have to travel too far you can be sitting in traffic for hours. So how far did you how far did the business travel in North London what sort of area did you cover? Well at the beginning as most other you know motivated excited ambitious trades businesses start out thinking they'll do anything and everything and they'll go anywhere yeah. <laughs> then very quickly you learn that that's not the best approach <laughs> so we covered a lot of north london but then when people started asking us to go out to dagenham and essex we're like, uh wait a minute no 
Raf will be sitting in traffic for a boiler service for seventy pounds for three hours. I don't think that's going to be a good, you know, yeah. use of his time. So then we started to really funnel down and be a lot more focused and targeted about what we did. So that was when I um, started to apply for local business awards um, yeah. and get local PR. So we um, won a business award in Hertfordshire, and that got. Um, in their hearts ad the local publication there yeah. um and then that started to drive up a lot more interest in our business and and um, a lot more phone calls yeah cool it's a really it's a really interesting approach that you went for the pr the awards the networking um it's a pretty powerful way of uh, of approaching things mm. one of the other sort of questions i had around that how did you think about sort of pricing and and i asked that in as much as i read a horrific stat recently that 50 percent Lots of trades businesses are growing. The industry as an overall uh, looks like it's in pretty good shape, um, but there's still like half the businesses aren't profitable. And, you know, one of the reasons that we see most commonly is people just don't price things by their time or their supplies um, correctly. How did you approach that as someone who sort of didn't come from the trades? How did you think about charge out rate, those types of things? We did a market research. Um, and my husband had um, obviously a bit of experience with that, yeah, working yeah. in his prior role. So he knew quite a lot about um, pricing and charge out at that point. There's other expectations in the UK, things like, you know, once you get to somebody's house, they only want to pay you for exactly the amount of time that you were there. And that can be quite frustrating for a tradesperson because they've traveled halfway across Hertfordshire to get to yeah. um, that person's house. And then they're going to have to travel back again. So people don't tend to take that into consideration in the UK. It's no, very different no. in the New Zealand, but I'd like to point out they charge for that time. Um, yeah. But in the UK, no, people don't want to charge for that. So when it comes to call outs, that's why I'd say a lot of businesses try to vi away from call out so much because of that issue with the pricing. Once you start looking at things like boiler installations, which for us as a gas engineer firm over there, we uh, did quite a lot of boiler installations and they were very profitable for us. Um, and they and and there you've given them a set price and a fixed price right. and you put your mark up on it and you estimate how long it's going to take you, usually a day or two, depending on you know the complications and, and the way the system is in the house. Um, so those are always a lot more desirable because you didn't have to worry about those conversations that you were going to have with the customer yeah. at the end of the job when they get the invoice. About the journey time. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's an interesting because if you're in North London, you're going to Hertfordshire, yeah, you're looking at, you know, that's a two-hour round trip if you're lucky, mm. uh, depending on the time that you leave. So that is actually quite, and if the job's only a two-hour job, mm. suddenly you're paying, you know, half of the total value. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just a thing that we see. I think we see commonly a lot of trades companies make the mistake of either not setting a high enough figure, um, sometimes saying no to customers. Did you experience any mm. of that in terms of picking the right customer that was prepared to pay the, the appropriate price for the jobs that you how did you feel to jobs initially when you was first starting well, the business to not end up with those kind of sort of jobs where someone really wanted the cheapest price and you're never going to make money on it or did you do some of those jobs to sort of generate word of mouth well so absolutely because there's um uh, a few websites in the uk where you can bid for jobs and usually people yeah. on those websites are looking for the cheapest quote um and anyone that kind of comes to you that's generally not from a recommendation or a referral or somebody you know they are often just looking around for prices so the ways that we used to eliminate or have a criteria around those kind of people were how many other quotes have they got <laughs> so find out from the right. from the customer yeah, have you yeah. called five different plumbers um and then you know that they're just looking for they're very price driven so we just forget about yeah. those uh, we'd say we wouldn't just stop answering the phone to them and have an approach along the lines of we're very busy at the moment perhaps you should call someone else <laughs> to be completely honest um yeah but yes, no, you start to learn uh, quickly who's going to pay you and who isn't and who's going to make things difficult for you and who isn't because you're, yeah, you're always going to get that definitely in a trades business. Yeah. And then what was the sort of turning point for the business? Was there a moment in time where you sort of, when did you scale employees and how did you plan for that? Was there a moment where you could just see the level of work was too much and you made that decision? How did you, how did you think about that? So we decided to move away from domestic plumbing. Um, I would think it was about 2012. So 
we had a, uh, a client come to us and he was building his own firm. He had originally started out as an electrician or electrical firm. He was moving into mechanical engineering and he was looking for subcontractors to be able to carry out these kind of larger scale commercial jobs. So we started working for him, started on a small scale, but as he grew, we grew alongside him. Um, what we started to see with those jobs were that they were Monday to Friday. So it meant that uh, my husband didn't have to be working on the weekends or out of hours. It also gave us guaranteed work. So we weren't um, yeah. waiting for the phone to ring. We knew that we had six months worth of work lined up. Um, we never created growth targets. We didn't have to, the growth. Actually, our problem was controlling the growth and not getting too big too fast. Um, and we definitely didn't focus on the staffing and how many staff we were going to need for that. And that's one thing um, that if you are really considering about growing your business and scaling up, you need to talk to an accountant. We had an amazing accountant who made it very, um, very, um, you know, she laid it out for me in a great detail uh, how if you reach a certain uh, turnover level, this is how many staff you're going to need. And when I started to see that on a bigger scale and then started to understand how much that meant I was going to be having to pay the wages and how much national yeah. insurance contributions and how much pension and things like that, then, um, you know, that kind of foresight can help you really understand how quickly you want to grow, whether you can grow quickly. Um, so that's when we... That was kind of further down the track, but we actually um, yeah. started taking on those works and we started doing a few, a few more and a few more for him. And then that um, very quickly became our main um, service was the commercial side of it. And I do remember distinctly my husband and I having a conversation one day saying, right, if we're going to do this, we have to say no to all of our domestic customers moving forward. And we just have to purely focus on this. And we were scared we were so worried that we were turning down all this business on the domestic side so that we could focus on the commercial. Um, but for us, it made sense because we had, at this point, two young boys at home. Uh, we were both trying to run the business full time yeah. and uh, it was exhausting, absolutely exhausting. But it does mean that you have to change a lot about the way you run a business if you're going to move into those bigger jobs. Yeah, there's a there's a sort of couple of questions there. One, did you did you hand off that domestic work to another plumber? Did you have someone else you could trust that you sort of funneled those those people to? Yes. Yeah, we did. We yeah. did indeed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah it's, sort of, it's one of the great things I think about trades companies how they I, I, what I tend to see is local companies all know each other and there's quite a good camaraderie actually between them, even though you're potentially competing for business. Yeah. And then the second part of the question is, you know, it sounds like you had a business plan that you actually did sit down, you know, the work with the accountant is, is something that I think a lot of trades companies don't necessarily do, which is, okay, mm -hmm. if I, you know, what are those turnover thresholds that mean I'm going to need four people even or five or six or whatever that number is. Mm -hmm. And what are the implications of that, right? Because it means that if things don't go quite to plan, you've suddenly got this big overhead and you mm -hmm. go from being profitable to, to being underwater. How mm -hmm. did you, did you have a, did you have a number against that? Did you have a plan or was it the, the work that you could see that was going to come? How did you approach that with the accountant? Did you sort of have a, a vision in terms of how big the, you wanted the business to be? Yes, we did. We did have a vision. Um, and we had, that was very much tied into the lifestyle vision as well the lifestyle yeah. that we wanted to have um you know it was all around those things that you'll do with the financial advisor where you know you want to have a house in St Albans and it's going to cost x amount and you want to have an income of x amount um and what is that going to mean you know how are you going to achieve that from your financial looking at your turnover and as your, your turnover grows your margins go down actually from a yeah. certain point around the 1.2 million pound mark, um, our margins started to go down. Um, so that's something that was really, really eye-opening for us because um, everybody gets so excited about the concept of scaling up their business. Yeah. But actually, yeah. if you're <laughs> living in it, it's frightening. <laughs> Um, it was, we had to then, once we got over that point, we had to also create cash flow forecasts. Um, so once you're in a commercial, carrying out commercial contracting, 
you are not, you know, your payment terms are completely different. You're not getting paid straight away or within 20 days of sending out your invoice. You have to put an application in and then you have to wait to be paid for 45, sometimes 60, 90 day periods. So you have to start looking at cash flow forecasting and then you have to apply for overdrafts. And so it gets a lot more complicated at that point. Um, Yeah, so... That was um, a big, big turning point for us and why, you know, as I said earlier, yeah. your business systems and processes have to change completely. It does. I think that's one of the reasons it puts some trades companies off when they're sort of one to, I want to say one to four people, but sometimes even one to two people, because there is that, you're right, you, you jump through a threshold where there is complexity, probably more risk, ultimately, because you've got a bigger team and a lot you know, job falls over. Yeah. There's all that risk to deal with, so it's more stressful. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't think that should be underestimated. And then, sort of, how did how did it go? I mean, obviously, I know I know the end sort of story that went very well. But do you want to maybe walk through the things that you think drove that drove that growth in that period? Because at some point, one point in time, you had at least seventy plumbers on the books yes. was working for you. We had uh, about seventy plumbers working for us, which was, which was I'd say, um, it was either it was a fortnightly wage um, transaction going out of about a quarter of a million pounds at one point, which was exhausting and stressful and very risky because we were always having to pay our labor before we were actually getting paid ourselves. So that's that's not for the faint hearted, I'd say. Um, What it did, it, it got us, because there's not very many firms that can actually operate at that level in plumbing. Um, it's, and it was a very quick path for us. So we had to learn very quickly. We had an amazing couple of mentors, people that we could uh, speak to directly, which not all right. um, firms have. So uh, my husband became very close with um, a, a guy that was working for a major um, contracting firm. And Raf was very good at developing those kind of relationships and getting kind of information out of people. And um, so we had an amazing mentor and he helped us no end. It was um, invaluable. Um, yeah. And what we did end up getting was these amazing opportunities to work on these architectural buildings that have completely changed the city of London landscape. Uh, we got to work on, you know, the um, Gherkin. We got to work on the walkie-talkie, yep. the cheese grater. Um, we also got involved in a few uh, amazing projects like the new Facebook headquarters, and we did Amazon's fit out. So, and then finally- oh, is that my, the uh, hmm. King's Cross one or the- No, the one Facebook at Liverpool one. Street one? Station. Liverpool Street, oh yeah, yeah. 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 Um, and actually probably the most amazing job that um, not many plumbers could say they've ever done is, doing the Queen's heating system at Buckingham Palace. That was the last job that my husband did before we left uh, London. So to have- Is that why you left London? Did you make make a mess of it? (laughs) You had a scarper. (laughs) No, I don't think so anyway. freezing the palace. (laughs) We've run away now, they can't find us. (laughs) So that was really exciting to be involved in- Yeah, it's amazing. Life-changing and, you know, buildings um to have that on our portfolios is yeah pretty cool that's incredible yeah and did you uh, and there was probably a lot more hoops to go through i presume from a compliance and security and all those things to do those types of jobs Um, oh yes wow yeah that's when your that's when your business has to be really slick on health and safety is so important at that level um they want to see your financials. They want to see your profit and losses before they're going to give you a job. No contracting firm is going to give you a job unless they can be 100% secure that you are going to be able to financially um, fulfill yeah. the obligations of that job. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of hopes that you need to, to jump through to, to be able to do that. Yeah. That's really cool. I mean, Gherkin, Walkie Talkie, mm. Queen. Um, yeah. it's, it's, an ama- it's an amazing list yeah. and if there's anything I mean I, I thought it was interesting you mentioned a mentor because I, I was going to kind of ask you that question I think one of the things that um, there's the business networks which can be useful you could maybe find a mentor there but that mm-hmm. probably is one of the most powerful things is working with people that have sort of been there before but how did you aside from the mentor how did you deal with that sort of mental stress that you would have been under sort of running a business like that and certainly that shift from being a domestic plumbing company to suddenly having, you know, that sort of payroll and that that level of, um, you know, risk on board? 
I was a very good customer of the Majestic Wine Warehouse. <laughs> oh, the Majestic Wine Warehouse, of course, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they knew my name and my face. <laughs> um, uh, so, jokes aside, no, uh, my husband and I were actually a great support team for each other. Um, yeah. Sometimes a lot of tradies, I, I think, feel like they're an island like they're alone on this island yeah, and, and yeah. only they can take on that stress and deal with it. We were very lucky to have each other. And um, I had a very different skill set from my husband. My husband has got an incredible technical knowledge and expertise, very good at the hands-on stuff. Um, but I was very good at the financial side in the marketing and sales yeah. um, and the relationship building. And we bounced off each other perfectly. You know, I think having that um the two of us working very closely together and having that support system was, yeah, amazing for us to deal with that kind of stress, to be able to, you know, come home from work and, and talk about it and um, be very open about everything that's gone on because we're completely open and honest with each other, which sometimes in business relationships doesn't really, doesn't really happen. No. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think that makes a that makes a huge difference having that having that level of support. And is there any other advice you would give, you know, someone who's maybe not maybe quite at the stage you got to there, but sort of starting to think down this path of growth? Anything you would look back on that you wish you'd done differently or the main piece of advice you'd give people that, that worked really well? Yep. One thing that I I know now that I I just I kind of my husband and I put it to one side whenever we talked about it was that a sustainable and valuable trades business moving into the future with growth really needs to have the maintenance and repair as part of its core services. So we completely focused on um, brand new installations and new builds. And that really put all of our eggs in one basket and put our business at a huge level of risk because we only had a couple of customers and we we're only as good as each contract that we won um we never knew when your next contract was going to come around so whereas with the maintenance and repair contracts you could have a, a maintenance contract for an apartment block for you know five years and that's yeah. given you just that's long-term security um and even though it does mean that you have to invest a little bit more in vans because we didn't have any vans we had very low overheads we didn't have um, right. a yard or anything like that um, to have that that other part of the um, business would have actually been fantastic just for, for lowering those stress levels as well <laughs> yeah yeah great and then sort of last quick last couple of questions one is you know you've been a very successful um, in the trades business what do you think needs to change or would encourage more women to get into trades companies or start in trades companies and the sort of you know, I think there's the the school age problem of getting more people in general into apprenticeships and, and joining the trade as a serious business. That's sort of part of the question. But the other one is that there's still a very low number um, of whether it's school leavers or other people women getting into trades. Do you think there's anything that you would you would do you think could be done differently to to attract more people? Yes, there's a lot of things actually. This is something I was working on a lot um, in in London before we left was kind of raising raising the reputation of the industry. A lot of yeah. people are put off the industry because it looks dirty, disorganized. You know, when they think of a tradie, they think of a white van with the sun newspaper and dirty coffee cups kind of along the dashboard. Um, I think if, if, every, if, you know, if there were more people working within the industry to kind of raise it, raise it up and show the amazing jobs that get done and the kind of work that's carried out and that real pride in that workmanship. Um, and also because a lot of the problems that I saw in the UK particularly was that children were generally discouraged from getting into trades because it was it, because of their reputation that it had, um, because yeah. also it wasn't seen to be a very high earning industry, but it is very much so a high earning industry now. Um, women were generally from my experience, encouraged into very traditional female roles like in early childhood centres or teaching or beauty therapists. Um, so it is a much harder sell to a young girl to get into the trades, a much harder sell. Um, there's definitely in New Zealand 
a lot more females in trades than there was in the UK. Still not not huge levels, but a lot more. Um, so yeah. when it comes to women, I'd say it's a hard sell. Um, but for young guys, you know, we went to colleges and we talked to young apprentices about careers in commercial plumbing, which they'd never even considered or even heard of before. And all those boys were telling us that they would, you know, they'd left school early because they weren't academic and they couldn't concentrate and you know they were always put down and they were always the naughty ones in class and unfortunately that's kind of that has followed through into the industry and its reputation but there's some incredible movers and shakers um, in the construction yep. industry and people doing amazing things and if we could just you know put them on a stage or really highlight them um, I think that might and engage better with educational institutions. I think that would help a lot. Yeah, I completely. I think there is a there's a lot of um, telling telling those stories, like your story and other people I speak to, their stories of success, and and a lot of things. The thing you touched on, I think, which is really important, the the lifestyle it can enable. Right, being your own boss, working the hours you want to work, picking the jobs you want to work on. Once you get to that level, those types of things mm. is really really important. I don't think there's enough of those stories out there. I think it's shifting with Instagram and some of the sort of influences you see in the industry that people follow and, and actually decide actually that looks like quite fun cool career mm. to be in so I think it will change but it definitely starts with education cool great um and thank you very much this has been uh, super insightful um really appreciate you being really transparent with your experience that you had um last couple of questions one was what are the mate you touched on New Zealand you're now based in New Zealand in Monica um yep. are there any major differences you see between the trades trades here and in the UK yes there is um, so, well, I've got a lot of experience in the area that I'm in and just kind of putting everybody in the picture, Wanaka has only got a population of 10,000. So it's quite a small town, um, but it's also a very wealthy town. Um, it's kind of like, I suppose you could say the St. Anton of New Zealand or the Chamonix of New Zealand. It's an alpine resort yeah. town, really. Um, so there's quite, you know, there's quite a bit of money here and there's a huge boom in construction going on here. Um, so what I've noticed here, differences wise, um, one, the profit margins are a lot higher in New Zealand. They charge for things extra like administration charges and they charge for transportation. Um, so they're covering a little bit extra of their costs. Um, here they have a huge issue with labour. Um, there's obviously COVID's just been and New Zealand's got its borders closed. So that's exacerbating the problem. But um, there's, yeah, there's a big problem with the limitation of how much labor that there is available in the marketplace here. Um, the, there's other really big difficulties for immigrants coming to New Zealand that my husband's experienced and that he's had you know, years of experience in the UK doing amazing work and his knowledge is incredible, but he really has gone back to basics here in New Zealand and he's having to get requalified. And then after he's got his plumbing license, he has to then work under a licensed certifying plumber for two years before he can then become a certifying plumber. So in the UK, you can self-certify yeah. your plumbing works, but not in New Zealand, you can't, not all of it. So that means you need to have a certifying plumber or a uh, qualification to be a certified plumber for you to really run a plumbing company in New Zealand so it's limiting very limiting um, I would say as well there are a lot of different products that New Zealanders New Zealand plumbing companies are working with in uh, the UK it was a bit more innovation quite a lot more innovation in the plumbing space um, in New Zealand, they, you know, around where we are anyway, this, they're doing a lot more kind of traditional type of plumbing. And here, uh, plumbers do drainage. Drainage is big. And plumbers get down there and they do the digging. Not in the UK. <laughs> plumbers didn't get involved in that at all. Um, yeah. There's very loose regulations on the gas front in New Zealand because we don't have matriculated gas everywhere. So it's very loose. So you don't have anything like the gas safe register. Um, so it's we're really surprised at how loose they are on that front. And as well as that, they're very loose on the health and safety here. Yeah. Totally. Oh, really? That surprises yeah. me. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. So that's just a few. Cool. 
just a few things that are different. Yeah, the charge out thing is actually really interesting. I'm sure there'll be some UK trades people thinking about that because that, mm-hmm. that journey time, if you're doing those jobs, um, some of that's about how you select jobs, but some of it's actually should, should there be additional charges. And uh, mm-hmm. I'm sure there's a lot of consumers would be happy to pay it if they understood the ramifications mm-hmm. slightly more. And then the last um, the last few questions we always end on are a few quick fire ones. So I'm going to, yeah. the first one, if you hadn't been running a plumbing business, is there another trade you've always uh, had an appeal towards that you would you would pick instead? So my husband said he'd be a welder. He was always quite interested in pipe fitting, which was a much more select um, and quite well um, well paid role in the UK. Um, me personally, uh, from a business front here in New Zealand and where we live, doors and windows glazing is is a big thing. Oh yeah, especially yeah. with the healthy yeah. home standards changing and everybody having yeah. to get. Double glazing, yes, in New Zealand, double glazing is not a big thing. <laughs> not a thing, no, no, it's actually very surprising for lots of people, actually a lot of single pane, very thin glass, yeah, yeah, not, mm. not double glazed, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, you don't so have extreme weather. Yeah. yeah. Well, it does get cold, actually, I say that, but in Monaco, oh, just for people, freezing. Said, you can paint it chamois, it does get very cold down there. And we don't have central heating, cold. so it's freezing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then next question, go to tool brand or tool. Oh, so my husband one. said Makita. Uh, Makita, yeah, they're very popular. Yeah. Do tend yeah. to be yeah, very popular. And then um, you're not in as a bigger lockdown on the South Island of New Zealand as the North Island of New Zealand. But when things do open up again, is there a sporting event or music event you would you would get to first that you'd really want to get to? Uh, so my husband would go to um, an Arsenal football match at the Emirates Stadium. That is his thing. Um, I probably would... enjoyed them more. Probably enjoyed those more when you were living there. I'd imagine than, than right oh, now. Yes. But, uh, yes. Anyway, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, for me, it's more music events. I'd say I like. Um, I'd love to see you two again, but they're probably not going to be touring around anymore. Or Coldplay, that would be amazing as well because I saw them in Earl's Court, and that was one of the best concerts I've ever been to. Yeah, I think they are. And Coldplay are actually are they touring at the moment? I thought down here. I'm not no. a Coldplay fan, I have to say, but um, no, not in you. No, no, I didn't, no. I didn't anticipate them getting here anytime soon. No, you might have to get on a plane for that one uh, when things open up. Um, and then, sort of, last question is: you know, you you come across lots of trades companies. Anyone you would recommend we should speak to next? Yes, actually, there's a local guy here in Wanaka who's running an electrical company, and his name's Wayne, and his firm's called Pretty Sweet Lighting. He's quite a character. And um, I think you'd quite enjoy having a chat with him because he's very funny. But yeah, you would have to bleep out some of his language. <laughs> We're getting used to that. That's fine. Yeah. <laughs> um, cool. Great. And this was um, super conversation. Like I said, really, really helpful. And I really appreciate you being really transparent about the experience you had building a really successful business. Um, yeah, I appreciate it. And uh, yeah, like I said, Anne's on the Tradeify board. So we take a lot of that insight into how we think about building the product and what we do in other parts of the world. So we're appreciative of that as well. And thank you very much. Thank you. So we'll speak to you again soon. Uh, yes. Yeah, and thanks to all of our listeners. Uh, as always, if you could give us the five stars on Apple or whatever podcast platform or video platform you're watching or listening to this on, that'd be great. And as always, any comments or suggestions, please do let us know. And until next time, thank you. And that brings us to the end of this episode. Behind the Tools is brought to you by Tradeify, job management software for your trade business. If you enjoyed the podcast, let us know by leaving a review and be sure to tell your mates about it. Email behindthetools at tradeifyhq.com if you or someone you know would be keen to join the show as a guest.